And so while there's a feeling these days of, justifiably, of Second Amendment rights being under siege, we should also celebrate some of the successes we've had in Colorado this year. The combined arms of the Independence Institute, of not just my testimony, but of all the, the things that everybody did collectively in reinforcing each other and helping each other, played a crucial and I'd say perhaps decisive role in the defeat of two pieces of really bad legislation. One was by Senate President John Morse, which would have, it was called the Assault Weapons Responsibility Act, but it would have allowed unlimited lawsuits against manufacturers of all types of firearms. It was not about what he calls assault weapons in his miswritten definition. It would have repealed protections that were enacted in Colorado in 1999, in 2000 and in 1984 or so against firearms manufacturers being sued because a criminal misused the gun. He was the president of the Senate in a Senate with a solid Democratic majority. And he, as the president of his own Senate, couldn't get that bill to passage on the floor of the Senate. And so it was withdrawn in a very bitter speech in which he compared, called gun manufacturers uh, and the National Rifle Association a sickness on our souls uh, that must be cleansed. Another bill was back in 2003, as Amy said, we helped uh, after a long decade of work uh, pave the way for the enactment of Colorado's strong concealed carry act. This is a something on which the Independence Institute and the County Sheriffs of Colorado were on the same side and supporting each other. And really the Concealed Carry Act, which we have from 2003, was primarily drafted under the model presented by the sheriffs, and especially uh, Sheriff, then Sheriff Jim Alderden, who had been a, a pioneer in, in setting up a fair system of concealed carry licensing in Colorado. The University of Colorado, for years, refused to obey the Concealed Carry Act and said, you can't, uh, neither students nor faculty nor someone who's driving a car just a cr crossing from one side of Boulder to another going down Colorado Avenue, which happens to go through the university, none of those people can ever have a firearm on campus. Uh, and if you do, you're, we'll kick you out of school. If you're a student, we'll fire you for a professor. Uh, and if you are just a motorist, uh, who was driving through, we will do everything we can to make your life miserable. And that was contrary to the Concealed Carry Act, which said that the permit to carry shall be valid throughout the state of Colorado, uh, regardless. And, and, and then it specifies certain exceptions, and the University of Colorado wasn't among those exceptions. Yet the University of Colorado promoted this theory that because the the CU is, is named in our Constitution, unlike other universities, that there is a mother may I rule and that nothing the legislature does applies to the University of Colorado unless the legislature first specifically says, mother may I have this law also apply to the University of Colorado. Well, the case eventually came to the Colorado Supreme Court, which as many of you know, is not known as the, uh, the most uh, pro-gun or the most uh, constitutionally orthodox uh, of courts. <laughs> but working with county sheriffs of Colorado, and now I will tell you one of the secrets, our executive vice president, Amy Cook, is the lovely and charming spouse of Sheriff John Cook of Weld County, who at the time was president of County Sheriffs of Colorado. So with working with Sheriff Cook and with County Sheriffs of Colorado as a whole, the association that represents all 62 elected sheriffs, we wrote an amicus brief for the Colorado Supreme Court 
that said, hey, here, here's the actual facts and statistics and criminological data on licensed carry. Oh, and by the way, you're talking about the intent of the law? Well, we're the guys who wrote it. This is our law, and yeah, you betcha, we want licensed, trained adults to be able to carry firearms for lawful protection at the University of Colorado, as on all other public university campuses. We think it is very important to public safety, and what the University of Colorado is doing is quite dangerous. And I would guess that our, our brief was mentioned uh, during the oral argument by the Colorado Supreme Court. And when the decision came down, it was a unanimous decision, 7-0, with the, all the court agreeing that, yeah, that Concealed Carry Act really does seem to may what, mean what it says. And no, to the extent we've ever said some laws have exceptions for the University of Colorado, unless you say University of Colorado, th those exceptions don't apply here. And although the plaintiffs in that case were right on the law all along about what the statute said, I think it helped the court come to, a, uh, come to the right decision as a matter of law to know that law enforcement was on the side of fair enforcement of the Concealed Carry Act. But the University of Colorado faculty, which has an uh, enormous number of anti-diversity, intolerant bigots on it, was quite upset by this. And we did a uh, podcast last fall with Catherine Whitney, who's a University of Colorado law student, and, and, and who carries, and started carrying after she was doing an internship with the district attorney's office, and saw the, the homicides and the crimes going on against unarmed victims. And you know, she's very personable, nice, friendly, extremely non-threatening kind of person and also very competent. And there were some faculty members like on the law school who could say, well, I disagree with you on this issue, but sure, we can definitely have a good conversation about it and a, a nice intellectual exchange. And there were others who were so freaked out that when she said, oh, you know, could, could we uh, just meet, I saw your email, you know, and, and your letter in the uh, campus newspaper, could we meet and, and, and maybe talk about it? And they'd get an answer back like, well, only if there are armed guards present and the entire event is filmed. So there, there was this. So unfortunately, Representative Claire Levy uh, decided to represent the uh, bigoted subset of her constituents and introduced a bill to repeal the uh, Concealed Carry Act's protection of right to carry on campus. This would have seemed like an easy thing to get through. Uh, this was the University of Colorado, which is a generally popular institution of the legislature, and they weren't asking for any more money. So it was especially easy to do them a favor. And the bill, uh, despite a great fight against it, led by the Republicans in the House, passed through the House and went over to the Senate and when it went over to the Senate, uh, Evie Hudak uh, told Amanda Collins, a rape victim from Nevada, who was raped on campus because she was disarmed on that campus, that it was better that she didn't have a gun because the rapist would have taken the gun away from her anyway, because that's what happens 83 out of 84 times when a, victim, a female victim tries to use a gun for self-defense. Everything about that was wrong. Uh, the, the statistic, and of course, is Amanda Collins pointed out, well, the, the guy already had a gun, so, you know, uh, uh, but if she'd had a gun, she might have been able to protect herself. And the uproar caused by that helped people understand that, oh, this isn't just a philosophical or legal issue. This is a very personal issue with real world consequences for real people. And you can't look people like Catherine Whitney in the eye or Amanda Collins and say, you shouldn't be able to protect yourself. Well, actually, Senator Hudak can, and you have to, in some ways, respect her bold sincerity. But even lots of the Democrats in the Colorado Senate decided they could not do that, and so the bill was withdrawn on the Senate floor and did not pass. And that's a very practical protection of civil liberty we achieved in the last legislative 
session. This makes a real difference right now to women and men and uh, people with disabilities and everyone else for having a practical ability to protect themselves. That was a, a big win uh, for our side and it, it's great that Independence Institute helped out on that. Let me now tell you about what we're doing in regard to a, a couple of the losses and then we'll go for Q&A. 51 sheriffs, when, when the gun issue hit the legislature in January, all 62 sheriffs joined together through the County Sheriffs of Colorado to issue a joint statement opposing all the new anti-gun proposals. And they started off by first of all saying the top thing they wanted to say, the most important reason in their view, was that they were unconstitutional. And then the sheriffs went on to explain with various, the various proposals why they were unenforceable and, and, and actually harmful to public safety. And that was all 62 across the board, Democratic, Republican, whatever. And they, on the day of the Senate hearings, on Mar committee hearings on March 4th, they came down here to the Independence Institute to meet and assemble before going over the legislature collectively to stand in support of real law and order and, and public safety. And so uh, we certainly had the largest number of uh, cars with uh, uh, lights on the roof uh, <laughs> ever assembled outside a, uh, a, a police convention that I know of. Um, and some of them might, the parking lot might have overflowed and if, if one was illegally parked, I, I don't think they, they got towed. <laughs> so the legislator, legislative committees politely listened to the sheriffs testify and then completely ignored them. The governor refused to meet with the sheriffs. And so we're, 51 of the sheriffs have chosen to take the next step and bring a lawsuit in court to have the law properly declared because the sheriffs are law enforcement officers. They're peace officers and their primary duty, number one on the list, is do your job in compliance with the Constitution of the United States of America. Line two, if anything below this conflicts with line one, stop, return to line one, do not continue. These unconstitutional laws have put them in an impossible position because of course they're supposed to enforce the general laws of the state of Colorado, but here you have ones which they've already said, correctly in my view, violate the Constitution of the United States of America. And so they must go to court to stop this conflict. Two of the bills will be the subject of the lawsuit. One is the ban on magazines, which is much, much worse than you know. If you read about in the newspapers, it's a ban on magazines holding more than 15 rounds. Our argument will be straightforwardly that according to District of Columbia versus Heller, the Supreme Court's major precedent, you cannot prohibit arms and accessories typically owned by law-abiding persons for lawful purposes. So the uh, sometimes known as the common use test. For handguns, magazines in the 16 to 20 range, and for rifles, magazines in the 16 to 30 range are not some kind of special high capacity magazine. They are the standard magazines which are sold with your gun as the manufacturer supplied equipment and there are literally tens of millions of magazines of this size in the United States right now. They easily pass the common use test. But the magazine ban, besides violating the Second Amendment in that sort of direct way, has some other poison pills in it. It outlaws any magazine which is designed to be readily, designed to be readily converted to hold more than 15 rounds. Well, what does that mean? This was discussed on the floor of the Senate 
And again, here's our combined arms approach. John Caldera did a YouTube video where he took a 13 round Glock magazine. You can take off the floor plate of the magazine. A magazine, a, a box magazine is, is just a rectangle really that, that can hold ammunition in a stack. You can take off the floor plate and put a little extender on. So now instead of a 13 round magazine you have a 13 plus 3 in the extender. So now you have a 16 round magazine. Well, pretty straightforwardly, if you assembled that and you had your 13 plus 3, no, the law is clear enough of that. If you ban magazines over 15 and you use 13 plus 3 and tell John that equals 16, that equals 16, that would be illegal. And that's, that's not a, uh, at least that's easy to understand. But what if you just have the 13 round magazine on its own? You don't even own any extenders. Well, is this designed to be readily convertible? So John did a little one minute uh, or a few minute YouTube video explaining this and that caught the attention of Channel 9 News who uh, did a little excerpt of the video and then they went to a gun store in Aurora, big store, and they said well so how many of your magazines are like this? Meaning they have a removable floor plate which is for so you can clean the magazine or replace the spring if it wears out and the store goes oh almost all of them. So then they go to Representative Rhonda Fields, the sponsor of the magazine ban, and they say, well, what about this thing, this issue? And she says, well, we really didn't consider this when we were, when we were drafting the bill. <laughs> As if, the, this is, all of this is standardized cookie cutter language coming from the Bloomberg gun ban lobby, formerly known as illegal mayors against guns, because the, the members of that group literally do have a criminal conviction rate far exceeding the crime conviction rates of people who have lawful handgun carry permits. Uh, the, the most recent one was a, uh, a mayor just got caught running an Ill illegal uh, gambling den, which beats the previous illegal mayor from a few weeks ago who got in trouble because he, as a just mayors against illegal guns, uh, brought a young man home pointed a gun at the young man's head and ordered the young man to perform sex on him. Uh, that, that, our guardians of public safety there. So anyway, but Representative Field said, yeah, you know, I, I, I understand. I, I know that this bans everything of the removable floor plate and that's the intent of the bill and we hope uh, people will comply with it. And so then Channel 9 called the governor's office and they said, well, what about this? And he, the governor's office said, and this is on nine news for the permanent record for all to see. Yeah, that's, that's a, uh, we know about that and yep, we're comfortable with that language and that, that's the intent. And so what we have is not a ban on magazines of more than 15 rounds. We have a ban on essentially all magazines, which is another way of saying a ban on the majority of handguns in this country, because the majority of handguns, semi-automatics as opposed to revolvers, use detachable magazines. The same issue applies, by the way, not only to rifles which use detachable box magazines, but also to rifles which have uh, a fixed integral magazine that's a tube underneath the barrel because most of those rifles have an end cap so you can take it off again to clean the spring, but it could be extended. So when you add up the number of, you ban most, most magazines for most handguns, 82% of handguns manufactured these days are semi-autos. And then you look at how many rifles use a, either a tubular magazine underneath or a box magazine. You're at the large majority of rifles and you can turn around and say, well, we haven't banned any guns, and that's true, except we banned the accessory which is necessary to the functioning of the gun and they've done this for the majority of rifles and the majority of handguns in this country. And it seems to me and to the sheriffs and we hope to the court that if in District of Columbia versus Heller that banning all handguns is plainly unconstitutional then maybe it's just as plainly unconstitutional that making it impossible to have the functioning versions 
of the vast majority of handguns and the large majority of rifles is also even more unconstitutional. So that's part of the story of the magazine ban. We are also challenging the background checks law, which is greatly misnamed. We are not making the argument, and staying neutral on the topic, of whether it's constitutional or not to require background checks on the actual private sale of firearms. That's an issue that we don't believe the court needs to resolve because we say you can resolve it in an easier way. If you do set up a system for that, you have to set up a functional system that people can actually obey. Well, the way this system is set up, the way that if A wants to sell his shotgun to B, they're both supposed to go to a federally licensed firearms dealer who will do the background check. The problem is, neither A nor B are customers of this federally licensed firearms dealer. The vast majority of federally licensed firearms dealers are small home-based businesses where people as a hobby or as a part-time business sell to their network of, of social acquaintances and they're not really interested in a pair of complete strangers showing up at their house. So now cut this down to the number of storefront firearms dealers. It's a lot of paperwork and actual legal risk for a firearms dealer to sell a gun out of his own inventory. If, you don't, if the paperwork isn't filled out perfectly, if there's things that you didn't actually know but you should have known, you can get in, in felony criminal trouble. You know, it, it's not a, uh, it, it's a uh, sometimes perilous process. Now, if you're a firearms dealer who's selling for $450, the gun that you bought from the wholesaler for 250, well, that's, you know, that conducting, doing all the paperwork and the background check is part of, you know, in essence, you're, it's part of the profit you're making, and you provide that. These days, a firearms dealer say, well, but suppose you're not buying out of the dealer's inventory where he's making a real profit on the gun. Just let's suppose you live in Colorado and you've got a friend in Iowa who wants to sell you his rifle. Uh, People who are not federal firearms licensees cannot, in most circumstances, engage in firearms commerce across state lines. So the way that I could buy a rifle from my friend in, in uh, Des Moines is the guy in Des Moines goes to a federal firearms licensee in Des Moines. The FFL in Des Moines ships the rifle to uh, an FFL in Denver. And then I go to the FFL in Denver, who does the paperwork and runs the background check. and as a fee for conducting this service, uh, an FFL might charge $50. But House Bill 1229, the background checks bill, caps this at $10 as the maximum the dealer can charge. The legislature was very clear in floor debate in the House that you can't be, dealers are not going to be forced to do this. It's purely optional for them. And, as it should be. But under this kind of system, who is going to be able to find an FFL who's going to want to do this for 10 bucks? Practically no one. And so say the sheriffs and anyone else concerned with proper law enforcement, we should only have laws that are actually, it is actually possible for people to obey. And this is not a law which is possible for people to obey. Now, I've just scratched the surface of some of the legal problems with these statutes, but this gives you a, an outline of some of the issues that will be coming forward when in the not far distant future uh, we bring the case. So at that point, let's, I'd like to, let's open it up to questions and whatever you all would like to talk about. Yes? You were talking about the magazine issue. Yeah. And you applied that to handguns and long rifles. I think you can also apply that, that argument to shotguns because they come with... Uh, Detat with with removable end caps. The yeah. nice thing was there was enough of a fuss raised on shotguns. And this is uh, shows some synergies. And the on March 8th, I was on the floor of the Senate at the request of Senate Majority Leader Cadman to help the Republicans, and for that matter, any Democrat uh, who wanted help uh, on this. and. 
as I was doing that, I was following Twitter. And you know, when you're in the Senate chambers, you can't really see outside. And so uh, I think uh, a reporter uh, tweeted that somebody's flying a uh, plane with a banner overhead that says House Bill 1224 bans shotguns. And the reporter said, no, it doesn't. That got fixed in committee. And I tweeted back, no, actually, it doesn't. The committee fixed. The committee amendment doesn't really solve the problem. Well, when you're, if you're a Democratic legislator, a Democratic senator, and you've got these five bills that are up, and the Republicans really want to talk about them because they don't like the bills and they're going to explain all the problems with them, and the Demo your Democratic leadership has told you, all right, if you're the sponsor of the bill, you've got to go up and you've got to introduce the bill. Other than that, you all shut up. We are afraid that if any of you open your mouths, it's going to be like Evie Hudak. It's going to be like Joe Salazar saying that on the floor of the House that women shouldn't be able to carry guns on campus because they'll shoot someone who they just think is trying to rape them. You know, they actually the reason he was strangling, uh, put his hands around their neck and started strangling them was you know, he thought they were choking and he was you know trying to give them the Heimlich maneuver. All, all these things, this uh, cascade of, of Aiken moments uh, by the anti-gun Democrats, of whom not all Democrats were like that, but many of the ones who were were, were quite bigoted and ignorant. So they're all ordered to shut up on the Democratic side and don't come to the, the podium unless you really have to, uh, you know, to maybe give your view of a proposed Republican amendment. So I'd imagine that it was a, a great time for them to stay up to date on their Twitter and Facebook accounts. And anyway, my tweet got noticed and Senator Hodge, the sponsor of the magazine ban on the Senate side, uh, came over to me and uh, said, will you help me fix this shotgun issue? So I did. And we went over to the Democratic leadership offices and I said, here's how you can just fix it is instead of like, you know, what does it hold, how many can it hold, and all this var variables of what if there's an extender but you don't own the extender, just say 28 inches. If the shotgun tube is 28 inches or more, that's bad. If it's 28 inches or less, that's fine. And you don't care how it got that way. If you stacked 11 extenders in a row on a short tube or whatever, 28 inches, everybody can understand what 28 uh, inches is. And she had an amendment drafted to that, introduced it on the floor, said uh, David Copel's not in support of this bill, but he helped me with this amendment. And Senator Greg Brophy, the really strong pro-Second Amendment leader, uh, said, congratulations, you know, Senator Hodge, thank you for doing this. This shows what you happen when you work with Colorado and you listen to Colorado instead of taking your instructions from Bloomberg and Joe Biden. Yeah. Mr. Caldera. Thank you, sir. I'll keep it clean. Okay. <laughs> I think it's difficult to understand how these things happen, particularly in, in, in court. Uh, can you just take a few minutes to share with us the Heller decision and how that came to be, which I would, I would argue is the most important uh, Second Amendment ruling in the history of the United States, but also the timing of that. In other words, did it hit them at the right time? And given the long-term approach that we use here at Independence, how did that integrate with, with help? Okay. Judges in general, regardless of where you put them on the political spectrum of left-wing, right-wing, all that, are by their nature overwhelmingly conservative, which means they are cautious people and they are the people who were the best in their class at coloring within the lines. Their inclinations are not to get too far out of step as the Supreme Court level, and we've had Justice Scalia speak at, our, at, at one of our events, and I had a chance to chat with him. This was not any secrets that he was giving away. But I, I asked him, and he, he said, so, you know, how, he explained to me that the court thinks sociologically, not necessarily him, who just sort of does what he thinks, and that, that's as far as 
it goes. But he said the court as a whole thinks sociologically. And for a second I was confused, like, you know, really? So you're like, you know, you're thinking about, oh, the, the you know, recent study in, in, in this journal or on that journal on, on data about from the sociology journal or the criminology journal. But what he meant was the court, did, what he said was the court doesn't want to get too far ahead or be too far behind. So that there was a 5-4 majority on the court to rule in favor of the Second Amendment in District of Columbia versus Heller was a consequence of, among other things, gun owners and the National Rifle Association being very active in two close presidential elections in 2000 and 2004 so that Justices Roberts and Alito were on the court rather than the kind of justices that would have been appointed by President Kerry or President Gore. That's the immediate explanation of 5-4. And then the longer explanation is that all the stuff we did on every issue, ever since I, I started working full time for II in 92 and started writing for it back in, in 88 on the gun issue, the fact, for example, that concealed carry, licensed carry, is now the law in 41 of the states is a sociological fact. It means it's normal to carry guns. So it means that when the justices sit down and say, well, this is a case about the DC handgun ban. And with this about guns in the home, we don't have to really say anything about carry, and they only said a little bit about carry. But it also means they say, well, you know, at some point, if, if we say the Second Amendment really is a real right, then at some point people are going to say, well, does, doesn't that mean people can carry guns? And gosh, you know, if we said it's a real right, we probably would end up having to say that they have a right to carry guns. But if they already can in 41 states, then you're not asking the court to get too far ahead of the people. Indeed, you're asked, asked the court is really just catching up with where we are already. And that was also true in the world of scholarship. I'm one of, I'm the most junior of about a half dozen scholars, uh, most of them practicing attorneys, who started writing a lot on the Second Amendment, uh, the earliest of this beginning in the, uh, the mid-70s and then me coming on board in the late 80s. And the, what we did influenced other scholars. And so we helped take the Second Amendment from in, as of 1978, being something that legal scholars actually knew nothing about. They knew that it was no individual right, it was only about the National Guard, and that anybody who said anything else was obviously a crazy gun nut and probably a member of the Ku Klux Klan. But if you ask them the next level of question is like, well, tell, us about, tell me about the Supreme Court cases that have said this, or about what you know about the original meaning of the Second Amendment, or all of that. Uh, they would have thrown you out of the building at that point because they couldn't answer even such elementary questions. So by writing on the original meaning and the meaning in the after Reconstruction when it was very important for the, the freedmen being able to protect themselves from America's first gun control organization, the Ku Klux Klan, up to the present, all of that legal scholarship we did helped move the Second Amendment from being an issue that you know, people might, a regular gun owner might rhetorically believe in in 1975, but being something that the legal elite could believe in in 1995 and in 2005. So now to say, oh, the Second Amendment is a real individual right, and of course, like everything else in the Constitution, there can be some controls on it, but to say that it is a real individual right, uh, and you'd be backed up by a mountain of legal evidence, was something that you could do in 95 or 2005, but you, it would have been a lot harder to do, impossible to do, in 1975. And so that made the amendment more intellectually respectable in the elite worlds of judges, and even especially more so in the elite worlds of their clerks, who are the creme de la creme of the law school graduates, and they're the ones who are exposed to the latest theories in the classroom and what's really going on and what's hot and new in the law reviews. And the judges have their clerks in part to stay in touch with, with that world. So we, Heller was the last step in moving the Second Amendment back to intellectual respectability. And so as what John was getting at is the, 
articles I was writing in 1996 did not become any more true uh, in 2008, but the cumulative effect of, of what I and other people were doing had its effect. And it's one of the things that helped the court by 2008 have the nerve to say that the DC handgun ban was unconstitutional, knowing that the New York Times and the Washington Post would throw a hissy fit at them for doing that. And I, I was on the, the oral argument team in Heller, assisting Alan Gura, who did the oral argument. I was one of his three little elves. Um, but by the, the, the time we got there, that was just the last thing. That was where the level we were at, where as once we knew where Justice Kennedy stood, and he uh, came out fairly early in the oral argument and expressing his point of view, that was it, and we'd won it, and it had been the final step. But that final step couldn't have been possible with the greatest lawyering in the world without 30 years before it of intellectual foundation. And that is another example of how what think tanks do is the most powerful thing in the world in the long run. Yes? Well, certainly whatever, you know, social networks you have, whether it's a, you know, uh, a friends club or right of whatever, whatever the, the social networks are, you, you're likely one of the best informed people on many public affairs issues in that group. And probably a lot of your friends and acquaintances are fairly influential within their own groups. So. Yeah, just what you do when talking to people and th that concentric network of information is really important. I, you know, the, the number of people who have been influenced by my writing third or fourth hand is probably larger than the number who have been influenced by reading it directly. So it's absolutely a, a world of, of, of sharing information and of course on our on our website, um, I've got DaveCopel.org, and then there's IndependenceInstitute.org, and there's Energy, and, and then all, all kinds of, uh, we, have, we have a large and, and growing uh, family of, uh, of, of websites. So those are good places to go that, you know, you know, maybe talk about some energy issue with one of your friends, and your friend says something, and you know, you, you don't know what the answer to that is, and maybe you know, come, come to Energy.I2I.org, and maybe we'll have the information. So. Really, all, all, these, all these friendly events with your whole social network have an important effect in the long run. Yes? David, just a question. It seems to me that uh, the water is very muddy if you, uh, well, I'll use myself as an example. I own weapons. Glad I've got them. My question is, I want to, in your opinion, a true, clear answer you need to roll those weapons into a trust to protect them so that my daughters or wife can acquire those after and I want to know just what is the correct answer. And I do not know the answer to that. I will, for background, say that the firearms covered by the National Firearms Act of 1934, machine guns in particular, which are now, there's only about 100,000 out there because new manufacture for civilians was outlawed in 1986. You know, they're, they're now quite valuable. Your, your basic entry-level machine gun is $10,000, and then if you'd like to shoot it for fun, uh, you know, you'll, you'll go through ammunition quite quickly and expensively. Um, so there was a problem, which is that in, in the 1980s, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms said, which, which does the, the licensing, registration, and taxation for machine gun transfers, said, we've got this new rule uh, that you have to get a permission note from your local police chief. And a lot of local police chiefs just wouldn't give anybody the permission note under any circumstances. So now you got the poor guy who's got a you know, collector's item that he'd like to uh, pass on to his family and can't do the transfer. And so the solution that people came up was instead of having the gun owned by 
uh, Ralph, who will then one day give the gun to Ralph Jr., is you have the gun owned by a trust, and as long as that trust continues, then you don't have to do the Form 4 for a transfer. So that that's what's been done for machine guns. I know people are thinking about setting up similar trusts for uh, you know magazines in Colorado, and I, I've never written a gun trust, I've never read a gun trust, and uh, I don't have valuable advice for you on that other than it, it's potentially something worth looking into. And, and, there, and there, are there are a number of lawyers around the country and in Colorado who have some specialty in this. It's way in the back. Well, this is, yeah, this is another issue that will be raised. So, grandfather magazine, let's say you, you have the 30 round Magpul uh, magazine. The law goes into effect on July 1st. The law says, oh, you, it, it, this you know, criminal penalty doesn't apply to people who have two, two criteria they fulfill on July 1st, or could they fulfill. One is they owned the gun on July, they owned the magazine on July 1st. Okay, that, that, that's very straightforward. You can like it or dislike it as a matter of policy. Everybody knows what that means. And that since July 1st, they have maintained continuous possession. A novel term in Colorado law, uh, which the law does nothing to define or let you know what it is. Now, well, let's say, let's say you read it broadly to say it's not just continuous physical possession, but it's continuous uh, constructive possession. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in possession of the chair in my office, even though I'm not, I'm in constructive possession of the chair in my office, even though I'm not sitting in it right now. Okay, but say do that. So you don't have to, you don't have to actually carry it with you at all times. But what it, mean, what it does seem to mean, and again, it's, this term may well be unconstitutionally vague, a whole other problem, but if it means what it seems to mean, say, then it, well, I'll tell you what the governor's office thinks it means, because I was talking with them the day before the governor signed the magazine bill. And I said, you know, this is a problem. Uh, you know, so here's the situation. You got uh, Joe who owns a Smith & Wesson pistol with a 13 round magazine, but <laughs> it's got a removable floor plate, so it's designed to be readily converted. So his 13 round magazine is contraband. And we're in complete agreement that we both read the law the same way. But since Joe has it on July 1st, he can keep it. Obviously he couldn't buy a new one, but he can keep this 13 round magazine. Now, suppose Joe leaves the house uh, for uh, the afternoon and he says, oh honey, here's my gun. Uh, if somebody breaks into the house uh, and tries to kill you, you shoot them first. And she goes, okay, fine. So under the background checks law, that's, that's no problem. He's, we, we got that fixed, so he does not actually have to make it a gift to her which is how the Bloomberg bill was originally drafted. You know, he doesn't have to say, honey, I know Mother's Day is, is, is not till next week, but I got you something. You can use my gun for four hours. Um, he, can, he can just make it an, out, uh, an outright loan. So get, letting her have the handgun in the home is no problem. Or borrow the, if she wants to borrow the handgun and take a target shooting or hunting. But this gun is functional only if it has its 13 round magazine. And the governor's office, and I agree, agreed, we, we saw eye to eye on this complete legal understanding. He can't let her have that 13 round magazine. So, you know, go buy another magazine that whatever magazine supposedly is going to be legal under this law, uh, go ahead and, and get one of those. And so he can get, they can share the gun, but he's got his 13 rounder and he's got, she's got her whatever new magazine is compliant with the law. But of course, 
not everybody is as, uh, let's say, a advanced in their care about owning the right kind of farms. I mean, John, John Caldera and I have both bought a number of magazines uh, in the past few months because we know that, especially with this floor plate problem, that you know your six-round magazines, you may never be able to buy a replacement for them. So you better get them, get them while you can. But you know, there's a lot of people uh, who aren't so up on the issues, and you know, if if it's legal for them to hand a gun to their wife, well, and, well, they leave town for a week and say, here's here's my gun, so you can protect yourself, and. Oh no! I said, yeah, I read they banned 15-round magazines, but oh, this is only this is only an 11, so that's no issue. That guy is committing a serious crime in the state of Colorado by allowing his wife to borrow his handgun while he's out of town for a week. That has this 11-round, designed to be readily converted, magazine in it. And again, this is why the peace officers and the law enforcement officers, the sheriffs, are coming back and saying this is a unconstitutionally bad law. The law enforcement depends, effective law enforcement in a free society, depends on the cooperation of the general public. And when you turn the general public into inadvertent criminals, you poison the relationships between law enforcement and the public and therefore greatly harm law enforcement. Yes, follow up. Well, well, not, not, not a class two misdemeanor, um, punishable by up to a year in prison. Um, uh, yeah, and, and the the answer to that, yeah, probably yes. If, well, well, certainly if you if you deliberately swapped your magazines, there's no question about the criminal liability there. If you don't, then it, then it's the you know then it's the issue. You get into other issues of general criminal law about mistake. Th things like that. How can you know? Uh, you know. I mean, what if you know? That's it's like. Well, what if you uh, what if you trespass on somebody's property, but you don't know it because the the moon is it's a black night and you can't see the no trespassing sign. Oh, that start start your shopping now. You bet. All of your all every every living descendant you have. Uh, <laughs> Get them magazines for all your guns. You bet. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. How is it possible for anyone to take anyone else's target practice when you're hiding or or uh, do anything of that kind? Um, if you if you're using a firearm with a detachable magazine or with a or a rifle with a tubular magazine. Uh, it seems very difficult to do so at all if you're talking about handing them the gun because when you hand them the gun, you're also handing them the magazine. Unless, you know, or make sure all you, I've, after you finish buying magazines for all your children and grandchildren, nieces and nephews to own before July 1st, I suppose you can then start buying magazines for all your friends uh, in case you want to go, uh, go target shooting with them sometime and let them borrow your rifle. Thank you. Thank you.